drop the link again to the content hub that Andre just mentioned. You can always go there, check out the bonus section for the blueprint and let's get into the questions. So how much budget do you usually spend for the six month ads framework? So instead of giving you the amazing marketers, it depends. There's three quick scenarios that I've gotten this question so often that I've gotten a pretty quick answer. So the first scenario is LinkedIn ads is in a complete silo. You don't have a whole marketing ecosystem in place. So you need LinkedIn to drive a lot of cold traffic to your website. And then you need LinkedIn ads to with the framework. In that scenario, it's going to be a longer runway. LinkedIn in a silo, it could be four to five months and about four to maybe four to five, maybe like $4,000 a month in order to get to a profitable ROI. If you have at least one other paid ads channel like Google ads, you've done a little SEO work, you have a semi-healthy little marketing ecosystem, three to $4,000 a month in about three to four months to get probably this build out and a profitable ROI. And then if you have a really healthy marketing ecosystem, two or three really solid cold channel, mature website that converts, you honestly could just focus on LinkedIn being a retargeting for you, just focus on the retargeting framework and you could get away with two or $3,000 a month and build out this framework. Awesome. One of the most popular questions here, I see what ad schedule and tools can you recommend? So actually I know the, the, the ones that I know are on the market are actually pretty expensive. We have our own actually. I don't think we actually advertise it. We use it for our clients. It hasn't been something we marketed as a standalone, but we do offer it. So if someone reached out, we do actually have a buy link and it's like $39 a month. So oh, well. the impactable one, <laughs> I guess is what I would recommend. <laughs> that's a great bonus because I know the pricing <laughs> yeah. of the other ones and yeah. yeah, this is a very nice bonus. Yeah. Usually it's the big, what is it? The ad stage and whatever, like you're spending a couple yeah. hundred dollars a month. All right. So let's have a look at this question. I think it's a good one. What do you recommend? What are your recommendations for the BOFO opportunity in terms of content personalization based on audience? So yeah. Bottom of funnel and personal personalizing it based on your audience, special link campaign needs 300. So what I would say is normally what I would do is on my, on my cold campaign, you know, it might, I'm not micro segmenting those out as much. So I'm usually, if I have five industries I serve, I'm usually having, I'm usually putting those in the cold channel, in the cold campaign, sending the traffic to the website. And then, yeah, if I can, I. I would segment out. Usually that would take a lot a lot more time because yeah, you do need 300 plus. But yeah, on my retargeting on the back end, I have a retargeting campaign that's specifically targeting marketing agencies that highlights, you know, the fact that we white label service. There's a separate one that it's out software companies and there's a separate one that separates out financial service industries. Those are, you know, usually our three main tiers. So I would say it would take a little more data and time to be able to segment those out. One way you could kind of jumpstart that is, I guess you could start wider. So maybe start with, you know, 90 day website visitors, but 180 day company page visitors and 180 days. So you could start broader, maybe even broaden out the company size and seniority level. So just try to get that audience above 300. And then as that retargeting audience grows, start tightening up your filters to get down closer and closer to that, like, that core ICP. And that's my advice in general for retargeting too. Like initially you can just start out saying, all 90 day website visitors I want to retarget. And then as that audience grows, you can get those filters tighter and tighter so that your, your money is being a little better spent. Awesome. So let's check the next one about the lead generation forms. So we usually get personal email addresses, but we are selling to B2B and would need business contacts. How would you overcome this? Personaling to B2B. So. It is opt-in if, if they're submitting their Legion form, A, I wouldn't use, I mean, I guess it comes down to, so email marketing is, is not my, one of my core things. I do know enough that I probably wouldn't be using my main domain for like these, these marketing sequences, unless it's like, unless it's like newsletter signups or current client flows. Like, so if these are warm leads, I also think it depends on what, what the the 
the lead magnet is. So if it's like a basic checklist, this is top of funnel, you would say these are lukewarm leads that need a lot of work. I would still consider that like a cold lead. And I would put that in like a, and I would, I would separate out my, uh, my main domain. I would be nurturing that maybe in a, my, a separate email. And then I would probably care less if it's personal or business because I'm using my email domain in a drip that I'm okay even using for cold. If, if it's something that is like way more like bottom of the funnel, they've shown some interest, then I think that is probably less of a concern because yeah, I mean, we have people, it's the same with like call bookings and follow-up emails. Like we have people booking calls from their regular Gmail. I think it's more of a concern if you consider them a lukewarm lead that's going to require a lot of nurturing. I guess I would just treat it like a cold lead, use a separate domain, and then you won't have to worry about about kind of compromising your main domain with that. Because I, I assume that's probably the the intent of this one is they're getting personal emails and then they're going to need to nurture them. Um, so that's kind of how I would approach that. I think sometimes I, I know that some companies are even not counting because when they have attribution and okay marketing and KPIs and then they just disregard all the emails that are personal. I know that it, maybe this is also something that could be behind the question because I've seen that happen as well. I mean, if if it's a personal email, I, I guess we've never really given it much thought at this point. If whatever email they're reaching out to, if it's an asset that we promised them, we'll deliver it to there. Like we don't disregard those or throw those away. Yeah, but we, I also wouldn't cue them into some long nurture from my main domain either, I guess. Yeah, we, we don't really disregard in our newsletter. People sign up to get the newsletter and they're happy to receive it. A lot of people use their Gmail. It doesn't really matter when people are ready. They're reaching out to us also via the newsletter. So maybe there's no reason to worry that and much. For, and for newsletter signups, honestly, personal emails are good because they might change companies and you don't want to lose them <laughs> as a subscriber like get to a new company, but you're still, you know, their go-to solution. And so, yeah, in that sense, it might be actually be an advantage. That's yeah, that's one. actually what happened to us. I was checking the stats when I was sending invites to our full final live podcast, the one that we hosted with you once. And there are lots of like a huge bounce rate because people were laid off changing companies and now you deal with invalid emails. So, yeah. Good point. True. All right. So the next one is about in in mail. So com, com, conversational ads, I suppose. Yeah. There's there's two different kinds that fit this profile. There's message ads and then there's conversation ads. Both of them can look like they're coming from a person from the company. And I I think someone from Metadata had done a nice little case study. And I had seen some success. But I will I will say that. I don't love them in the cold layer. I like them as a personal touch in the retargeting layer. So, and then I, I kind of mentioned, so what, what I would do and kind of referencing back to the previous question of segmenting out, one of the things I, I have seen is they visit my website and then I think these in mails, because they look like they can be a little personal, I think doing something to make them more personalized is the key. So whether I think the metadata case study he had a super curated list. These people had gone to a specific event. He, he, they fit a certain profile. So he was able to reference like, Hey, I noticed you signed up for this event. And it was like personalized to that group for some attribute. And so what I've done in the retargeting layer is retargeting website visitors who are also marketing agencies in my demographics, I'll do an in-mail retargeting and I'll say, Hey, I noticed that, you know, you're running a marketing agency and you recently checked out our website. I was wondering if you stumbled across this section and realized that we actually do white label. If that's something you wanted more information on, I'd love to talk. So personalizing it to the person, I either it, that's the only way I think it would work in the cold, but it's easier to do in the retargeting as segmented. The conversation ads I really like because the conversation ads give like multiple choice. It's honestly like a chat bot. So like my previous message, you know, Hey, have, did you see the white label? Would you like some more information? And I can have three options, watch the white label demo. Let's jump on a call. And then the third I usually include is like, why should I trust you? And then whatever they click, it opens up like an additional option or sends them to a link and, and kind of answers that question. So then you let, you get to like guide them through that journey. So we, we don't, 
we don't use that as a standard practice like with our agency clients there's different cases where depending on the list or the segments it makes a lot of sense but they can be they can be a clever way to get back in front of people awesome let's check the next one how do you overcome a problem of retargeting audience being either too small to serve or being small enough that the frequency shoots up super fast yeah so if the first the second one if the frequency is shooting up too fast and you're at the minimum budget of ten dollars a day one easy way would be to use an ad scheduling tool depending on your overall budget that may or may not make sense because one of the things that you know i have little pockets and that's that's one of the reasons i used it is I don't even want this campaign running every day. I want it running Monday and then Wednesday and then Friday and not even all day on those three days. Like I just want it kind of opening up and closing back down a couple of times a week to stay in front of these people without oversaturating them. The first one though, if if it's too small, sometimes what you can do is, is yeah, if, if you can expand it in any way to broaden it out, if you're trying to just start with like any retargeting and I, I have no other restrictions and I'm still not able to get to three, what you can do is add on, you can upload a list. So maybe you can find some other list like your email list or people have booked calls with you. Try to get some other outside list that you can upload to supplement that can help you get over that threshold. Or what we've what we had played with before is uploading a dummy list, a list of, you know, three or four hundred contacts that are like not active on LinkedIn at all that you can kind of just add on so that you can market to the people you want. And there's a handful of people then that, you know, may get your ads that are unlikely to log in, but it allows you to, to actually get into retargeting a little faster. But I would say maybe supplement with your own list. That would be the best answer. I love it. That's a good one. Let me share the next one. So I think you spoke about budget, but specifically, what about the budget in the services industry and specifically in the US? Yeah, I would say, yeah, that the, the main options, if, if you have, I would say three to 4,000, most LinkedIn ads experts, you know, are saying the minimum budget is like three to four grand. And that's usually if in my mind, that's especially if you need LinkedIn to really hold its own, operate more in a silo, the, the more you have going on outside of LinkedIn, the less you can get away with, especially in some cases, I've seen some companies that I just advise them not even to like, don't start with cold LinkedIn. That's the most expensive and the, the hardest to get an ROI from. If you have, if you're spending a decent amount on Google ads, just start retargeting that traffic on LinkedIn and you should be able to see it, you know, improve the ROI of what you're already doing. But for, I'm, I'm actually in the B2B service industry. I started my original budget on LinkedIn was when I was testing was 500 to a thousand dollars a month. And it took me a long time to, to see an ROI from LinkedIn ads at that budget. But I also didn't have a mature marketing ecosystem at the time. So I would say, you know, three or 4,000 is, is a pretty healthy budget for B2B service. You might still it might still take about three months to carve out a, a noticeable positive ROI there, and anything else you have going on outside of LinkedIn will really help cut that time down. So let's move forward. I'm trying to. Yeah, we have probably twenty more questions. It's just insane. <laughs> yeah, I won't be I able like to it. cover everything, guys. Yeah, but just make sure to post these questions in our Slack community, so we would be able to address them. Let's move to the next one, and boom, boom, boom. Here we go. Do you exclude your retargeting audience from your cold layer once the retargeting starts to feed out. Where's the value? Yeah, I do. I So when I set up my cold audience, I usually exclude my website visitors, my company page visitors, my ad interactions, video views. So yeah, all of the things I'm going to use in retargeting, I typically exclude from the cold. Because to me, I want it to be a barrier. Once there is some kind of like hand raise sign of intent, I want them to move from my cold, bland, boring kind of add to my retargeting and and I, I kind of like that that separation. I kind of like pulling them through. All right, that was a quick one. Let's address a practical one. I think this one will, will be quick as well. How do you choose the value for the conversion if the conversion values are not always the same? So 
this would this would probably be a collab like so if it's a business owner or you're running your own ads for your own company you know this this is going to be an internal debate if you're a marketing manager managing someone else's it would probably be a collaboration with and it would be you know for us i guess the best example is how did we do it so we looked at our numbers and we looked at client acquisition cost and we looked at our conversion rate you know how many booked calls does it take to get a closed client and so what is the value of one booked call worth you know we valued our booked call at 150 dollars, and i don't know if you know <laughs> the the math can be fuzzy and there's not going to be a perfect answer i would say first you know get something on there maybe like a super rough estimate like for a lot of people, I'll value their call booking between one and two hundred dollars for a booked call. For some enterprise or you know higher LTV, a booked call could be worth a lot more. It could be worth three or four hundred dollars. But a hundred to two hundred dollars seems to be like a number that a lot of people don't mind assigning to a booked call. And then what I did was the last touch for booked call, I made it worth like one hundred and fifty. And then each touch, I made it worth like ten, so I could still see the journey. And then for the 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 biggest debate, I guess, is for like. If you can get purchases as a conversion, are you are you measuring or do you want to set up a conversion value for the initial purchase or the estimated LTV? Because, you know, setting it up as an LTV might give you a better idea of, you know, if the amount of spend is healthy. Whereas if you we set ours up as an initial purchase, because part of part of me, I'm a realist and I try to have the most conservative numbers possible. So if I underestimate the value of my conversion value, it keeps me more honest and aligned. If I estimated my LTV, I run the risk of like overestimating and then, you know, blowing money that I shouldn't because I, I got that math wrong. So I think as for me personally, underestimating the, the value seems to be better for me because I can operate on more conservative values. Now, if I'm doing that for a client, I'd probably be, you know, maybe I would be pushing for LTV because it then maybe helps our conversation because if they're holding me to the fire based on initial purchases and we're losing money, then I'd have to have the more complicated conversation of if this is still profitable in the long run. But yeah, those are the those are the two thought process and I don't think there's any right answer, but total LTV or initial purchase would be the two main ways and then you kind of just have to do that math internally. I, I do tier. average I do average purchase. Sorry. So we have three different tiers and instead of like breaking those out, I do like an average purchase value, I guess is the other part. Thank you. One quick question from Samara. How do you determine the value of each conversion? Yeah. So I guess that was kind of the, the previous question is I just look at the average value. We actually do have three tiers and I did get it. I finally did get it to the point where each purchase of the different tiers was pushing them to a, I put a UTM attached to those different. So I actually was able to get an average purchase value of each tier. But then for us, like even our, even our purchases are custom. So even like our tier two package, like they might have a bunch of different, you know, things involved. They might be buying three months, six months, a year, um, and the value is going to be different. So I just went with average initial purchase value and try to guesstimate it. All right. So let's get this one. I think it's an interesting one. What audience size do you recommend for the initial code layer? So this I've been going back and forth. So I think LinkedIn recommends like at least, they say at least 30,000, I think 30 to like 140,000. That, you know, is entirely different if you're running kind of an ABM playbook and you have a, a very tight, small group. So I do say the, the two caveats to that is if, you, if you're running a smaller group, then you just need to adjust your strategy. You're gonna have to pull more of those trust and credibility elements that I would traditionally put in the retargeting for a larger TAM. I'd pull those into cold and just saturate that audience with more of those layers that you want them to see. The, one of the benefits I found in a larger audience size is that I do think LinkedIn's algorithm is slowly maturing. So the the word of wisdom for Facebook is that you start with this broad audience and you trust the algorithm. Like that was terrible advice for LinkedIn. I, I it might still be terrible advice, but I I've been test I've been doing my own experimenting, and I feel like it might be getting better. But that might also be because our account has a an incredible ton of 
conversion data for it to work from. So I think that's still probably terrible advice for like most people. So I would say, you know, if it's if it's over 200,000, that's probably too broad. 150,000 is probably pushing. The danger of going too small though is that you run the risk of that group not being active on LinkedIn. So having a bigger audience gives LinkedIn some options of saying who's active, who's not, you know, you, you can get a better price. If you're if you're targeting a 20,000 person audience, those cost per clicks could be really big, especially if it's like a coveted, you know, high priced audience that's not very active on LinkedIn. So that's the drawback of that. Yeah, I had, I had like while we were talking about the ABM approach and things like in the ABM, we would already suppose that the accounts you selected, you selected them based on some intent data or engagement, et cetera. So they, you could even almost treat them as more warm or retargeting, retargeting yeah. while the 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 pure cold would be to generate that intent and engagement when it would make more sense. And then another thing that I've heard somebody said was that they would widen the accounts, but widen the uh, target smaller number of accounts, but widen the the people in there. So, mm. you know, the whole marketing team, for example, instead of just the CMO and the VP of marketing. Just actually, what I heard. Of you, try that. I actually really like that idea because it's usually like I I feel like if instead of targeting that one decision maker, like that makes sense with when you're cold calling or cold emailing, you want to, you know, you don't want to waste time, like talking to everyone in the company, but with digital marketing, yeah, you could expand it. And if there's a couple of people in that company, like when that person eventually is convinced and wants to, you know, try you out, if they're, if they bring that conversation into the room and there's other people in that room who are familiar with the brand and are on board, like, yeah, that could drop some walls and get you across that finish line a lot faster. So I really do like that idea. I think another thing, LinkedIn is a social network. So if you are like, con connected and I'm engaging with somebody, you're likely to see that. So there's that as well to kind of spread the message inside of the buying committee. All right, let's have another one. I think we can do a few more. So what do you do when you saturate the part of your cold audience? What do you do when you saturate a part of your cold audience? For instance, if one of your ICPs is CEO from small startups in the UK plus gets two plus delivery. What do you do with that audience? So yeah, one of the things and one of the telltale signs that you're oversaturating an audience is that you start to see diminishing returns. So usually when you set this, the most active people and the, the best prospects are getting your ads, they get a high frequency, you'll usually see a pop of results and then it'll start to slowly dwindle as you'll start to see diminishing returns. So usually what I do with that is I would either a look to expand beyond like maybe like we just talked about maybe expand to other people in that department in that company widen that conversation or I, I might look to reduce the budget to that so you could either expand it within the same campaign or you can duplicate that campaign and then have a separate campaign that maybe goes broader so you could have a super dialed in these are my decision makers they get its own de dedicated spend and then here's a slightly wider broader audience and then you can distribute the budget. That way, if you take some budget away from that, because that's the big thing, like the frequency is determined by the size of the audience and the amount of the budget. So if you can either increase the audience or decrease the budget, you can restrict that frequency a little bit. Those would be the best ways that I think you could do that. All right. I like this one as well about the metrics. So during the six month periods, what metrics should we track to know if my LinkedIn campaigns are progressing well? So I, even though I am a hundred percent part of this demand gen movement, I'm not one of those attribute, attribution hating people. I think you should be able to absolutely track and try to see the progress. So the biggest things for me is first leading indicators. So yes, keep an eye on cost per click and click through rate and also key page views. So your pricing page visit, your contact us page visit, if you have separate landing pages for those, I would set those up as, I call them micro conversions. So if they visit my contact us page, I assign it a conversion and I can assign a value of $1. So, you know, it's not gonna mess with the whole ecosystem, but it lets me know that we're headed in the right direction. So initially in the first month or so, in the first 30 days, I don't expect to see actual conversions, people's first visit to our website. In the first 30 days of retargeting though, typically you will see real signs of life. Key intent page visits, hopefully a couple of leads or you know a, a booked call or two. The cost per conversion is gonna be high. So don't judge the whole process based on what you're initially seeing. 
as the retargeting audience grows, as you start to build up more layers, the amount of key page visits, conversions, and leads will increase, and the cost per conversion and lead will start to decrease, usually all the way up to, you know, once you have this fully built out, you'll usually start to hit like a kind of a plateau. Usually you'll go through ups and downs from targeting then. I need to expand the target. I need to find a different pocket. I need to give this pocket a rest and come back to it. But yeah, leading indicator, key page visits. And then once you start getting conversion data, measuring cost per conversion, cost per booked call and tracking that progress over time. Well, thank you. I think we will need to wrap up. People will be automatically redirected to the next ses session. So awesome. thank you so much. I think you called these people hippie marketers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just just trust the process, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. This was amazing. Guys, don't hesitate to reach out to Justin, either via Trenches or on his LinkedIn. Thank you again so very much and speak to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, guys.